Hey there, peeps. I'm coming to you live from my kitchen in Webster, Iowa today with chapter seven of Who Could That Be at This Hour? I'm feeling a little crazy today. I think the, the staying inside has finally gotten to my brain. So bear with me. Chapter seven. It was pitch black everywhere around me, and I felt as if I had fallen into the path of an enormous shadow. I had learned how to do it in what you would probably call an exercise class, but that doesn't mean it wasn't difficult or frightening to fall that way. It was difficult and frightening. The fall was quick and dark, and I landed in the tree on my back, with many twigs and leaves po poking at me in annoyance. Still, I felt it. Then I relaxed, as I had been trained to do, and lay out on the top of the tree, letting it support my weight, but still I felt the enormous shadow cast upon me. It was not the shadow of the hawser, or of any of the other trees nearby. It was the face that appeared next to me, the face of a girl about my age. I could also see her hands clutching the top of a ladder she must have leaned against the tree. Somehow I knew, as she blinked at me on top of the ladder, that the girl in question had already begun to cast an enormous shadow across my life and times. That was quite a stunt, she said. Where did you learn to fall into a tree like that? I've had an unusual education, I said. Did they teach you how to get down? The best way is to wait for someone with a ladder. Someone, she repeated. Who exactly? I don't know, I said. I don't know her name. Hello, she said. I'm Ellington Faint. And I sat up to get a better look at her. It was not so dark that I couldn't see her strange curved eyebrows, each one coil coiled over like a question mark. Green eyes she had, and hair so black it made the night look pale. She had long fingers with nails just as black, and they poked out of a black shirt with long, smooth sleeves. And right before she started climbing down the ladder, I saw her smile, shadowy in the moonlight. It was a smile that might have meant anything. She was a little older than me, or maybe just a little taller. I followed her down. When I reached the ground, Ellington Faint looked me over and then brushed a few leaves from my collar, before offering her hand. The statue felt solid against my chest and my hands were a little raw from the hawser. I could not see Theodora above me. It was possible she did not even know I was no longer behind her. You haven't told me your name, Ellington said. I shook her hand and told her. Lemony Snicket, she repeated. Well, follow me, Mr. Snicket. I live in that white cottage you passed over. You can rest there from your flight. She led the way through the trees to the cottage I had seen from the road and from the hawser. Curiously, it looked even smaller now that we were close up, with a few windows here and there, and a creaky-looking door and a white brick chimney puffing gray smoke into the night. A small arch over the door read, Handkerchief Heights, in faded letters. They say a washerwoman used to live here, Ellington said when she saw me looking at the sign. She used to hang handkerchiefs out to dry in the backyard and that gave the cottage its name. Who lives here now, I asked. Just me, she said, and opened the door. The cottage was no more than one small room, and most of that room appeared to be a fireplace with a colorful fire lighting every corner. The crackles of the fire mixed with music in the room. The crackles of the fire mixed with music in the room, music I'd never heard and liked very much. There was a small cot in the far corner, with some rumpled blankets and pillows, and a large striped suitcase open on the floor, with all sorts of clothing tossed all sorts of ways. I spotted a long fancy evening gown, some heavy hiking boots, an apron that a chef might wear, a red wig, a long zippered green tube that might have been a purse, and two small hats I'd seen on the heads of Frenchmen in old photographs, both dirty, both worn, and both the color of a raspberry. In the opposite corner were a small sink and a short wooden table, completely bare, with one stool tucked under it. Sitting on a windowsill was a dented pair of binoculars, and on the floor in the center of the room was a small box with a crank on its side and a funnel on top. It took me a moment to realize that it was an old-fashioned record player, with the music I had never heard before winding out of the funnel. The music sounded interesting and complicated, and I wanted to ask the name of the tune,
There were no books in the room as far as I could see. I should have known better. Have a seat, Ellington said to me, gesturing to the stool. I'll make us some coffee. That would be restorative. Coffee, I said, my voice louder and higher than I had planned. I don't drink coffee. What do you drink? Water, I said, tea, milk sometimes, orange juice in the morning, root beer if I can find it. But not coffee? People our age don't usually drink coffee, I said. Nor do they usually drop into trees, Ellington said. I guess we've both had unusual educations. I pulled out the stool and sat down, and Ellington busied herself at the sink with a metal coffee pot, rinsing it out and then filling it with water before adding several scoops of ground coffee from a paper bag stenciled with the shadow of a black cat. Black cat coffee, she told me. Corner of Caravan and Parfait. It's one of the last businesses left in stain by the sea, and one of the only reasons I venture into town at all. She sighed. Mostly I stay right here. And what do you do here, I asked. She gave me a small smile. You first, she said. Why are you flying through the air in the middle of the night? I reached into my vest and put down the abominating beast on the table. A little too hard, so it made a loud thunk. Ellington glanced at it briefly and then reached for a pair of creaky iron tongs used for moving burning logs around in a fireplace. She used the tongs to pick up the coffee pot and then held it over the flames before looking back at me. What is that? she asked. Some kind of toy? I took a long, close look at the statue for the first time. The abominating beast still looked like a seahorse, if a seahorse could be a nasty, frightening animal. The eyes of the statue were actually small holes, as was the mouth, with its lips drawn back and the tiny, sharp teeth making thin lines over the hole. The entire statue was hollow, I realized, and for a moment I wondered if it had been carved to fit over a candle so that the fire might shine through the eyes and mouth to create an eerie effect. I turned it over to look at the base of the statue, which had a strange slit cut into the wood. There was a small, thick piece of paper pasted over the slit like a patch. The paper patch felt curious to the touch, like the paper wrappings on cookies in the bakery. I shook the statue to see if there was anything inside, but it did not make a sound. I don't know what it is, I said finally. I've been told it's worth a lot of money. And someone's going to give you this money, she asked me, in return for you stealing it? Something like that, I said, remembering my promises. Then why did you drop into a tree? Something was going wrong, I said. What was going wrong? You'd know better than I would, I said. You were watching me the whole time. The coffee pot began to gurgle, and Ellington removed it from the fireplace and set it down, bubbling on the table before fetching two cups and two saucers from a rack next to the sink. She poured two cups of coffee and let them steam in front of us for a moment on the table. The steam lingered in the air along with the odd, jumpy music. It was dark out the window, but I knew had it been daytime that we would have had a wide view of the clusterous forest. Ellington grabbed a pillow from the cot and knelt on the floor before replying. How did you know I was watching? she asked quietly. I saw something glinting at me from the window of the cottage, I said, right where those binoculars are sitting. You were watching me and my associate on the hosser. Why? I've been watching this area for days, she said, and took a sip of her coffee. I left mine alone. It wasn't that I thought she had slipped laudanum into it. It was simply that I didn't like coffee. I didn't even like the way it smelled, dark and earthy like soil. But Ellington smiled a little as she sipped. What are you looking for, I asked, and pointed to the abominating beast. This? She put down her coffee and smirked at the statue. The statue frowned back in reply. I'm looking for something much more important than some silly statue, she said. I'm looking for my father. What happened to him? She stood up. Somebody took him. Some terrible man. My father and I lived together in Kildare Fields, a town farther up the road a ways. I've heard of it. It's a nice enough place, Ellington said. Although something was going on that was bothering my father, I could tell. And then one day I came home from school and he wasn't there. He wasn't there by dinner time and he wasn't there by bedtime. And in the morning, a man called with a fearsome voice. He introduced himself as Hangfire and told me I'd never see my father again. That was six months ago. I'd been looking the whole time. And I'm beginning to believe that what Hangfire told me was the truth. She walked to the cot and reached under it to show me an enormous, 
messy pile of notebooks, newspapers, envelopes, and parcels. This is what I do, she said. I've been following any lead I can find. I've interviewed dozens of people. I've checked on hundreds of rumors. I've written letters and telegrams, made phone calls, and knocked on doors. I've sent countless packages to people he knew, most of whom left Kildare Fields after the flood. I send photographs of my father, copies of articles he's written, anything that might help people tell me where he is. A while ago, I heard that Hank Byer was hiding out here in Stained by the Sea. He chose a good location. With so many abandoned buildings, this town is full of hiding places. Yes, I know. I've been living in this cottage ever since, hoping for a glimpse, glimpse of him. If I find Hangfire, I know I'll find my father. But this Hangfire person wouldn't just give him back to you. No. So what will you do then? Anything and everything, she told me, and it made me shiver a bit. She thought about her answer. She hadn't just said it the way most people said most things. Why would Hangfire kidnap your father, I asked her. That's the most mysterious part of all, Ellington said, and poured herself more coffee. My father never hurt anyone. He's a kind, quiet man. Two tears rolled out of her eyes, and she brushed them away with her smooth black sleeve. And he's a wonderful father. I've got to find him, Mr. Snicket. Will you help me? I had fallen out of one mystery and into another, and perhaps that was why I made another promise, this one as foolish and wrong as all the others. I'll help you, I said, I promise, but not tonight. Right now, right now I have to leave. Thanks for the coffee. You didn't drink any. I told you I don't drink coffee, I said, but come find me tomorrow when we can work together. I'm staying at the Lost Arms with my associate, S. Theodora Markson. What's the S stand for, she asked, but then there was a knock at the door. The clock above the fireplace told me it was close to two in the morning. Ellington looked at me and asked the question that is printed on the cover of this book. Who could that be at this hour? It was the wrong question, both when she asked it and later, when I asked it myself. The right question in this case was, what was happening while I was answering the door? But when the hinges stopped creaking, I was thinking only of the officers Mitchum, who were standing there with matching stern eyes. Aren't you that snicket lad? Harvey Mitchum barked at me, while Mimi Mitchum barked. What are you doing here? I replied yes to the first question, and visiting a friend to the second. What sort of young man visits friends in the middle of the night, asked the male officer suspiciously, sniffing the air and frowning. What sort of hanky-panky are you up to, asked his wife. I replied a friendly one, and I don't know what you're talking about, but I could tell these were the wrong answers. We need to talk to you, Snicket. Harvey Mitchum said. There have been reports of a burglary. Somebody stole a very valuable statue in the shape of a mythical beast. Do you know anything about that? I've always been interested in mythology, I said. That's not what I mean, he snapped. Your chaperone was hanging on the hawser and refused to tell us why. It's still too early to make assumptions, Mimi Mitchum said, but it wouldn't be surprised if she's as big a criminal as you are, Snicket. I'd say she's a bigger criminal, her husband said. No, he is. She is. We can settle this later, Harvey Mitchum said with an annoyed look. Right now we're going to search the premises for this valuable statue. Don't you need a warrant for that, I asked. This isn't the clusterous forest, the female officer Mitchum said, gesturing behind her back. This is stained by the sea and we are the law here. Step aside, Snicket. I stepped aside, but not before looking behind me and seeing with relief that the bombinating beast was not in plain sight on the table. Instead, Ellington Faint was in plain sight, holding her envelopes and parcels in an awkward pile in her arms. Good evening, officers, she said. It's not good evening, Harvey Mitchum said sternly. It's bad behavior. You should follow the example of my boy Stevie. Stewie, he knows better than to stay up late. That's why he's sleeping in the car right now. It keeps him calm, said Mimi. And alert, said Harvey. And good-looking, added his mother. That's true, the male officer said. Stu Mitchum is as cute as a button. I tried to think of buttons I'd seen that liked to torture small animals, but I couldn't. Mr. Snicket, Ellington said quickly, will you help me with these parcels? I took a step toward her. Of course, Miss Ms. Faint. She smiled at the Mitchums. Mr. Snicket and I were just about to take a walk to the mailbox and deliver these things. Wait until our search is over, Harvey Mitchum said. 
and we'll drive you over there ourselves. Young people shouldn't be out at this hour, Mimi Mitchum said. The bombinating beast might get you. That's a myth, I said. Ignore the bell and you'll find out, the male Mitchum said, and brushed past me to peer, out, peer around the cottage. Ellington hefted a parcel into my hands that was about the size of a milk bottle. It was wrapped in newspaper and I saw she'd hurriedly, hurriedly put a few stamps on it and scrawled an address. S. Theodora Markson, The Lost Arms, Stained by the Sea. The officers began rifling through Ellington, Ellington's things, and she and I stood at the doorstep of the cottage. Why didn't you address the package to me? I whispered to her. I thought it would be suspicious if I were mailing a package to someone who was standing right next to me, she replied. Is the mail delivery, is the mail delivery reliable here? I asked. Yes, she said. You should have it by tomorrow morning. Surprisingly, delivering a rat, delivery around here is very fast. I tucked the wrapped statue under my arm. I had been told that if I found someone suitable during my apprenticeship, I could recommend them to our organization as a new member. It was too soon to make that decision, but it didn't feel too soon to smile at Ellington as the Mitchams muttered to themselves inside the cottage until they gave up. We give up, Harvey Mitchum said. There's no statue in this cottage. I took one step, so I was standing outside. That's definitely true, I said. Well, thanks for stopping by. Not so fast, Mimi Mitchum said. We're driving you both to the mailbox and then home. I don't know what you ruffians are up to, but it's over for tonight. Get in the car and say hello to our adorable son. Ellington and I followed the officers Mitchum to their rundown station wagon and piled into the back seat, where Stu was waiting for us with a sleepy yawn and a cruel smile. Lemony, he said in the friendly voice he used to fool his parents. It's so wonderful to see you again. I nodded at him, and he reached out his hand and gave me a hard pinch on the arm that the officers Mitchum did not see. Ellington saw it, though, and she reached forward herself and grabbed his wrist. Stu frowned, and I saw her fingernails digging into his skin. It's lovely to meet you, Stu, she said. I just know you and I are going to be lifelong friends. Stu made a high-pitched sound certain boys find embarrassing, and we rode the rest of the way in silence. When we arrived in town, Mimi Mitchum brought the car to a squeaky halt and watched as Ellington and I dropped our packages into a lonely, scratched-up mailbox. The hinges of the mailbox door made a rough, unpleasant noise, and I was reluctant to drop my package in. So you're reluctant, I said to myself. Many, many people are reluctant. It's like having feet. It's nothing to brag about. The package made a muffled clunk as it landed, and then we got back into the station wagon and drove the short, empty distance to the lost arms. I thanked the officers for the ride and gave Ellington a secret smile and a wave, and Stu nothing at all. The lobby of the lost arms was empty except for Prosper Lost, who was murmuring something into the telephone. I stopped for a moment by the plaster statue of the woman without arms or clothes and suddenly felt how tired I was. Yes, I said to her. I suppose I'm in trouble, and I headed up the stairs to see.